The Department of Justice says 18% of women in the United States have been raped at some point in their lifetime. 18%. That's almost one out of every five women. Or the populations of Washington State, Oregon, Idaho, Nevada, Montana, Wyoming, and Utah combined. about two-thirds of victims know their attacker. So why do only 16% of cases get reported? Well, it's complicated. Sometimes victims don't want to get the offender in trouble. Sometimes they believe police can't help. It's one of the most horrifying crimes, and yet the perpetrators rarely get punished. Just 3% of rapists in the country serve time in prison for their crime. Think about that. Sometimes it's because police are ignoring their most powerful pieces of evidence. For most of the day yesterday, the hashtag why I didn't report was trending on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all over social media. Uh, even the daughter of Ronald Reagan, Patty Davis, wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post where she went public with a rape, with her own rape. I was just you know, following his lead kind of thing. We started kissing. I said, you know, I, I, I have to go back to my friend. And he said, no, no, stay with me, stay. And he said, put your hands on the wall. And so I did. I mean, I didn't know him. And, you know, when the few things he said to me before we went outside were just nice, calm, normal things. He said, uh, get on your hands and knees and arch your back. And I just did it. At that point, I was kind of, you know, in autopilot a little bit. I just wanted to go. And I, this is kind of the quickest way I thought I could leave, just do what he says, and then you can go. It was pretty painful. I just kind of froze, you know, and I was just trying to, like, I don't know, it doesn't make sense, but block it out. Like, just wait till it was over. I got up and I went to walk away and he said, oh, wait, put your name in my phone. And I just autopilot. I just did it to leave. I didn't want him to follow me. I didn't want him to ask me any more questions. I just wanted to leave, so I just put my name in his phone. Luke Lazarus would later say he wanted Saxon's name as part of a trophy list of women in his phone. It started at a local bar in 2007. Christine and some friends had been drinking and ran into guys they had seen around town. I regret even going out that night. I regret leaving with one of them, um, who I thought was a nice guy. He took me to an apartment. I had consented to be with him, and he said he had to leave the room, and he came back, and he had three of his friends with him. I was fearful that if I made a noise or fought back, that something worse would happen. So I just laid there and took it until it was over. The next morning, the guy that I had consented to was laying next to me and I was terrified. I didn't have any words. I didn't say anything to him. I just asked him to take me home. A few days after her rape exam, Christine met with a detective. She told me what happened to me wasn't rape. She got out the North Carolina statute and read it to me. I've seen women that go out to a bar go home with a man that they just met, hardly know, sleep with them unprotected, and then the next day feel guilty about it and try to say that man raped her.
New Jersey lawmaker has a plan that would make it a crime to lie in order to sleep with someone. The assemblyman calls it rape by fraud. At least five states already make it a crime to have sex by fraud, but some say it should be a matter of personal responsibility, not a case for the prosecutor. A woman had sex with her boyfriend's brother. He came into her room late at night. It was dark. Uh, she called out the name of her boyfriend and he didn't do anything to correct her and then she filed uh, a claim of rape against him. There are so many lies that we tell each other. Go to your local bookstore and take a look at the number of books um, written by pickup artists about how to seduce women. Um, you know that, we don't, we don't consider that to be rape and rightly so, but um, you know, there's a whole industry devoted to helping people to basically lie or present themselves in a better light in order to get sex. Um, and so it's really unclear w where you draw the line exactly between sexual seduction and sexual fraud. If we're going to be realistic about this, do you think that there should be laws on the books that say you have to tell somebody before you sleep with them that, that you have an STD or that you are or are not on birth control? I mean, those are things that can have lasting effects. I think that's a really great question. It's a really tough question. I, I don't think that those are, are the sorts of things that courts should be left to decide. I don't think that, that that's the sort of thing that we can legislate. I mean, the law is a blunt instrument, and I don't, I don't think that you can deal with such sensitive issues um, and moral quandaries uh, in the courtroom. Yeah, maybe we could just all have a personal taser or something, because, you know, if somebody <laughs> did that to you, I would be really, really angry. And you want some kind of retribution, but I agree. I don't think that it's up to uh, the government to perhaps tell you what you can and cannot do. I woke up to someone touching me. Abby Finney still has trouble talking about that night two years ago. Obviously, I assumed that was my boyfriend because I fell asleep with him. Only it wasn't. Abby discovered the man in bed with her, the man she just had sex with, was not her boyfriend. It was his friend, Grant Ward. You believe that you were raped? Yes. But the man she says raped her was acquitted in court. His record cleared, even after admitting he tricked Abby. Just because they're lying or being deceptive doesn't make it rape. This case exposes a legal loophole in sexual assault laws across the country, sparking a national conversation about rape by fraud. Couldn't you tell by smell or the way your boyfriend might normally touch you or that, that this was a different person, that maybe there was a way to know that this was not the normal person that you would be with? Well, first of all, my boyfriend and I hadn't been together that long. She unzipped my boy's pants and knew what she was doing. She wasn't unaware of the sex. Stealthy. The act of men removing their condom during intercourse without consent is a disturbing trend amongst young men that is not only real, but all too common. While many agree that this act is a violation, attorneys are having trouble seeing how this action can't be punished in the eyes of the law, as it is not currently classified as rape. Could this legal loophole allow men to violate women and get away with it? Hours after you were raped, you sit in a hospital room under fluorescent lights and consent to a forensic exam. Your body is the crime scene. A nurse asks, when did it happen? Where did it happen? Did he ejaculate inside of you, on you? Did he kiss you, lick you? Did you shower? The nurse says she needs to know every detail of your assault so she can examine you. You're asked to undress slowly while you stand on a special sheet meant to collect any trace evidence that shakes loose. For three to five hours, 
The nurse swabs your mouth, your breasts, the bite mark on your neck. She scrapes under your fingernails, combs your pubic hair. She inserts a speculum inside you and uses blue dye to illuminate places that are torn. The nurse cuts a hair from your head. She takes photographs of every injury from far away and close up, using a ruler to show size. When the exam is over, the evidence goes in a container smaller than a shoebox. This is your rape kit. This is what you endure to get justice. No one tells you that the exam may be pointless, that police might treat your rape kit like trash. Case overload, lack of training, a culture of victim blaming, all factors and shoddy investigations leading to purged DNA evidence nationwide. CBS News first reported five years ago that 20,000 untested rape kits were gathering dust in state crime labs and police evidence rooms going untested. Well, that story and others like it convinced some police departments to begin testing their rape kits. Rape kits are administered to victims right after their attack to collect the perpetrator's DNA. And yet, many women still go through this invasive five-hour procedure for nothing because so many police departments don't test all their kits. Some tell us it's too expensive. Others say it takes too much time. But the result is that rapists can go undetected and attack again. 4,000 untested kits were gathering dust at the Cleveland Police Department. Las Vegas has tested just 16 percent of its 5,000 kits. Tulsa, Oklahoma is seeking funding to test 3,400 kits. And Wisconsin has 6,000 statewide and is prioritizing which kits to test first. This is not just any one city or state's problem. This is a national problem and needs a national solution. In Cleveland, it's investigator Nicole DeSanto's job to track down women who were raped decades ago so they can testify against their newly identified attackers. I've had victims who said they didn't feel very worthy or they felt worthless back then because no one took them seriously. A widespread failure to prosecute cases of rape. In many cities, a lack of funding often means that DNA and other physical evidence goes unexamined, leaving rapists free to attack again. Jerika Duncan and producer Laura Strickler met one woman still waiting for justice after 26 years. She lives in Memphis, Tennessee, where the police announced in 2013 they had more than 12,000 untested rape kits. Police records show the last time a detective worked on the case was two weeks after the rape. We examined four cities that tested over 28,000 rape kits, but it only resulted in a 1% conviction rate. Houston tested more than 6,000 kits to get 28 convictions so far. Detroit tested 10,000 kits, and to date, just 69 rapists are off the streets. I pictured this moment differently. I waited three years, 10 months, and one day before I addressed my rapist in court. I thought I would feel stronger or a sense of accomplishment. Instead, I felt like I had barely survived the legal system. I felt even more broken than I already was to begin with. I got justice, but it sure didn't feel that way. I decided to document my experience going through the legal system as a survivor to give a glimpse into what this process is actually like. Capturing the back and forth travel from where I live in New York City to where the assault happened in Los Angeles. For every 1,000 people who are raped in the US, only 230 of them report their rape, and fewer than five perpetrators will ever be put behind bars. My rapist was one of them. A man who I didn't know drugged me at a local college bar and took me to his apartment. He sexually assaulted me while I was incoherent. And a day later, I found out he had taken videos of what he had done to me while I was unconscious. I decided to report him to the police. I thought filing a police report, having video evidence, and getting a rape kit done would be enough for people to believe me. It wasn't. A rape kit can provide DNA evidence when a sexual assault has occurred. The process involves standing naked on a piece of butcher paper while nurses collect DNA samples and take pictures of your body, followed by an internal examination with lots of poking, prodding, and swabbing. It's a highly invasive exam that takes hours to complete. As horrible as it was, I had to do it. 
if I wanted any chance of this going to court. I waited six months for my case to even get picked up by the district attorney at the LA County Sex Crimes Unit after they decided it was strong enough to hold up in court. And while I'm forever grateful for this, I quickly learned the reality of my situation, that the justice system isn't set up to protect survivors. I became my own advocate. I would have to call to get updates on hearings about my own case, only to be left devastated after being told it was postponed again. In the court process, you're assigning someone to help you. They're your DA, a public official who acts as a prosecutor on behalf of the state but they're overworked and understaffed. I would put all of my faith and trust and questions into this person, and I would finally feel some sense of control or understanding. But I ended up having to work with four different DAs, each time having to rebuild that relationship all over again and come to terms with the fact that yet again another stranger knew these embarrassing facts about me. The idea of going to trial haunted me. Not only did I have to look at the man who took so much life out of me and my family, but I would have to rewatch him doing this through the videos he took. I felt humiliated, angry, and depressed about the way I was being portrayed in front of a room of strangers. They look at those videos of me and they're like, you know, are you sure that wasn't consensual? Why would I be like putting up with this for the last four years of my life? Trial ended up being one of the most destructive parts of this entire process. And while my case is seen as a victory in the eyes of our legal system, my story sadly represents a small minority of cases. This is one of the many reasons we do not see other women coming forward. Regardless of all the evidence, court appearances, and having the freaking LA District Attorney's Office on my side, it was still barely enough to put my rapist behind bars. To remind you, 78% of rapes are not reported, and women of color who are even more likely to be assaulted are even less likely to report these incidents. And who can blame them? I think it's a good rule of thumb to not have sex when you're drunk, even if it's completely normal in your relationship to. Let's say we're both really drunk and um, if we had sex, would it be consensual? A lot of people are saying yes, when in fact, no. Even though we're in a relationship, even though we've had consensual sex, it does not matter if one party is drunk or both parties are drunk, you cannot have consensual sex. There's not, and there's not implied consent in a relationship. When you're drunk, you don't forget your name. You forget maybe where you left your keys. I don't care how drunk you get. I don't care how high you are. Consent is still consent and you will not forget that. I was drunk. I was doing the drunk thing, doing what drunk people do. You want to decrease campus rape? That's easy. Get rid of alcohol. No one has that conversation. It's like I did my PhD work on alcohol. 50% of the people who are murdered are drunk. And 50% of the people who kill them are drunk. And almost all the date rape situations are consequences of excess intoxication. But the, yet there's a party culture on campuses and anything goes. An investigative journalist. I'm going undercover to expose the landlords who offer shelter in exchange for sexual acts. It is happening everywhere. He said that the rooms become available because it's his daughter's and she went to uni in September. Sex for rent is wrong, it's cruel, it's immoral, and also it preys on the most vulnerable in society. Websites such as Craigslist are being used by corrupt individuals to advertise for free accommodation in return for sex. There has to be clearer criminalisation around the sex for rent issue. At the moment, yes, there are laws, but they're really confusing and the victims don't understand them and the landlords don't even know that they exist. So until it's made clear that this is illegal, this is why, and this is how much time you could do for it, no, nothing else is going to be done. Across the animal kingdom, gifts are an integral part of the mating ritual. And now one website is cutting straight to the give and take, connecting broke college girls 
with rich older men to trade their youth and beauty for cash and prizes. So, is it prostitution or a brutally honest search for happiness? Tommy was an IT executive who retired with enough to spend about 150000 a year on the ladies combined. Cheaper than a marriage, he says, and a small price to pay for what he gets. When you walk into a room and you have a beautiful woman with you, it's, it's a compliment to you as a male. It's, it's like pulling up in a really nice car or something, you know. I hate to compare it that way, but it is. It has a good feel to it. Virginia's late-term abortion bill is gaining international attention. It would allow terminations at any point during pregnancy, including up until the point of childbirth. A fetus is literally a parasite, like it is sucking the life from a mother Yeah. every single day. Like, that's literally what happens. That's not Don't even know who my baby dad is. Tolina came back to the show three more times to find Malachi's dad. First, we tested Ryan's nephew, Nathan. You are not That's <laughs> it.